Hi, my name is Kathy Nickham. I'm the Education Director for the DPC Ed Center, and welcome to this month's patient webinar on navigating a renal diet, decoding the mystery. In this program, you're going to learn about uh, nutrition and some diet tips, two things that we often hear are topics that people are interested in. You'll learn about uh, how things change over the different stages of kidney disease and in different treatment modalities, changes that happen um, in terms of what food you might need or not need. Uh, next slide, please. As a reminder, uh, your lines should be muted throughout the program. You are welcome to ask questions or to make comments through the chat box. And your written questions will be answered, um, although this slide says at the end of the program, we've decided during this program, you can ask your questions in the chat box throughout the program, and our speaker will address them um, as she can. You'll receive the link to the recording and the slides within a week. And there's also a, a feedback form that we would appreciate your completing at the end of the program, which lets us know um, what works for you, what other topics you would like, and gives us um, just some feedback that we really appreciate. So please take a moment to uh, give us some additional information as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker to you, Fanny Sun Whalen. Some of you may have uh, seen her a couple of years ago. Um, present with us and her past webinar is also in our recordings and you're welcome to take a look at that as well. Fanny is a registered dietitian. She's licensed in Tennessee. She's been working with renal patients for 11 years. She specializes in home therapies and for the past nine years with transplant as well as all the stages of CKD. She also ex has experience working with older adults and end-of-life nutritional care. And Fanny has also recently joined uh, DPC Ed Center's Advisory Council, and we are very happy to have her um, as part of our team uh, in an advisory capacity. And so at this point, Fanny, I'd like to turn the program over to you, and we'll all learn more about uh, navigating the diet. Thank you, Kathy, um, and thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy day to join this conversation. I hope I'm able to make it worth your while. Um, next slide, please. We'll just jump right in because um, I tend to have a lot to say. <laughs> um, but if you have questions, please type them in the chat box and I'll try to keep an eye on that. And um, I think Kathy will help me as well. So. I try, try not to miss any questions. Try and make it a little more interactive feeling if, if that's possible with these things. Um, so <clears throat> your doctors told you you have kidney disease. Among many of the thoughts that are probably going in your mind, one of them might be what diet should you follow? So today we're gonna break down some of the main differences in the diet recommendations that will be required to meet your specific needs based on where you are in your disease progression. And before we dive in, and I will, I, I, I was reviewing my notes, I was like, I say this a few times, it is really important to discuss any diet changes with your healthcare team before you implement them. Everyone's needs are going to be different based on individual differences. And so it's, it's a difficult thing to give kind of a one size fits all diet. So um, definitely talk with your team before trying anything new or eliminating things and adding things. Next slide, please. So when you are in chronic kidney disease stages one to four, the main goal at this point is going to be to slow the progression of the disease, which can delay your need to start dialysis. Um, there's a, some research coming out in the past few years that shows that the delaying your start on dialysis will, will ultimately lead to a better prognosis um, in terms, terms of mortality, morbidity. So, you know, delaying is, is best when, when able. Um, cal at this point, at these stages, your calorie needs will increase just slightly. 
um, an individual needs are going to be based on factors such as your age, uh, your lean body mass, and physical activity level. There's going to be a slight decrease in protein intake at this point. There's, um, you know, the, the goal here is to, to not tax the kidneys to make them work too hard. And so having a little bit of a decreased protein intake will help that. Um, there's also science at this, um, a lot of science coming out that supports more plant-based proteins. You know, a lot of people will ask about, well, what about complete proteins? Plant-based proteins aren't complete proteins, but when paired with whole grains, plant proteins can become complete, as you know, become completed proteins. So some examples of that might be um, plant-based proteins and pairings would be beans and legumes paired with whole grains like rice or couscous, for example, or nuts and seeds, such as like in the form of a nut butter paired with toast, um, those kinds of pairings. A lot of times when you see like, um, you know, there's so many meat alternatives now on the market and a lot of the veggie burger type um, meat products are, you know, if you get like a black bean burger, there's going to be some kind of grain that's mixed in there typically. And so that will provide with that complete protein. Um, another question I do get, and I want to mention this, some people will ask, well, does it have to be a completed protein within a meal? And it doesn't. It just needs to be a completed protein within the day. So if you were to just eat a spoonful of peanut butter, you know, at some point in the day, if you're eating a whole grain, that will provide that completed protein within your body. It doesn't have to necessarily be paired up at the same time. So um, if you're diabetic, you might need a slightly higher protein intake just to help manage your glycemic control a little bit better. Um, sodium is a really important mineral that we all need. It's a mineral that is found in salt and many of the prepared foods that we eat, a lot of the processed foods. You know, the American diet is generally very high in sodium, and it's not just from the salt that we add to foods, but it's also in the processed and packaged foods that we eat. So, you know, salt and sodium reduction is going to be beneficial because it can help control blood pressure and reduce that fluid retention, uh, which can be less taxing on the kidneys. When you are eating too much sodium, your body kind of wants to dilute that and, so, and flush it out. And so it's going to want to retain that fluid, which is going to be harder. It's that, that fluid is what is going to increase your blood pressure. And all of that is going to just be harder on that kidney. So... Um, so having that salt and sodium reduction is going to be important. And I'm distinguishing between sodium versus salt here because I often hear people will say to me that they don't use salt in their cooking. But then upon further investigating, they tell me that they eat things, you know, they often eat fast foods because they're working outside of the home or picking up foods on the way home, packaged and processed foods, deli meats hot dogs, uh, bologna, box macaroni and cheese, you know, flavored mixes like, um, you know, the flavored rice mixes, uh, things like that, ramen noodles with the seasoning package. Um, even the sometimes, you know, you can find like meats or fish that are already like seasoned that and you just have to take them home and put them in your oven. All of those kinds of foods, too, are going to contain sodium. So you might not be adding additional salt to that food, but that's going to be a high sodium food. And so I just wanted to distinguish between that because, you know, I, I do hear that often that people, um, you know, have, there's a there's a discrepancy there. Um, and, you know, I do also want to mention that even when foods don't taste especially salty to us, there is going to be some amount of sodium in that food. So it can be a little bit sneaky. So, you know, take, for instance, uh, something like packaged flour tortillas or a slice of bread. You know, there is going to be some sodium in there. And it's not a lot in some cases. In some cases, it's quite a bit. But it all can add up. And given that the sodium recommendation is so low that it's, it can be hard to kind of balance, you know, well, what's what's really worth, you know, where should I give a little and take, you know. So just remember that you don't have to physically use any table salt to exceed your sodium intake. So um, this is where food labels, reading food labels and looking at them is going to be, uh, can be an important tool to have. Next slide, please. Okay. So 
It can take some time to train your taste buds to enjoy foods that are less salty, especially if you've been accustomed to eating things that are saltier. Your your taste buds kind of can, you know, be accustomed to that and kind of numb out a little bit. So a lot of times we see people who use a lot of salt in their cooking. Um, things just don't taste as salty to them because they're so accustomed to that level of salt. So it can take a little bit of adjustment. Um, and so some of the tips here that we'll talk about, you know, it's not adding salt when cooking or when you eat your food, um, avoiding table salt, kosher salt, sea salt, iodized salt, you know, there's all these different kinds of salts on the market. There's Himalayan pink salt, there's gray salts, there's all these fancy kind of artisanal salts, you know, all of these are going to be a, a form of sodium. Um, Use seasonings that do not contain salt, such as garlic powder, onion powder, chili powder. There are other herbs and spices. Mrs. Dash is a really popular brand of seasoning mixes. I'm sure all of you guys have heard of that. Um, one brand that has become more popular in the past few years is a brand called Dan O's. And Dan, D-A-N O's. And it does contain a little bit of salt, but it's it's also got a ton of other herbs and spices, so it really packs a big flavor punch. So just to give you a comparison of the sodium content in salt versus the seasoning, um, a seasoning like Dano's, salt contains almost 600 milligrams of sodium per quarter teaspoon, whereas Dano's contains 50 milligrams for that same quarter teaspoon. So if you you know, you still have to kind of watch the quantity that you use. You know, it, you, you probably don't want to use a couple of tablespoons of Danos, um, but it can help you ease off of the salt if it's hard to go cold turkey, because it can be, you know, if you're used to using a lot of salt and all of a sudden you're using no salt, everything's going to taste very bland, you know. So um, it's also important to avoid using flavored salt, such as garlic salt, onion salt, celery salt, or seasoned salt, which I don't know if, you know, Lowry salt, that Lowry seasoning, I think it's called, um, that is a very high sodium seasoning. And some people don't realize that it's, it's actually really just like a flavored salt. Um, buy canned foods that say no added salt on the label. Look for lower salt or no added salt. Sometimes packages will say reduced salt or lower sodium. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's low sodium. So, it, you know, it's reduced from the amount that the regular version has, but it's still going to be pretty high. So it's, it's important to still watch that portion control, you know, that when you're using those products. Um, but packages now will say no added salt, you know, especially a canned vegetables, you know, will have no added salt. Um, a peanut butter is one to look out for, box mixes, things like that. Avoid cured and processed meats such as ham, bacon, sausages, hot dogs, lunch meats, bologna, chicken tenders and nuggets, things like that. You know, those are all going to contain nitrates, nitrites that are sodium based. And so that's, you know, that's that flavor, that salty, smoky flavor that you're getting. That's all sodium there. So try to avoid it. Avoid canned soups unless the labels say reduce sodium level. And then even then, like I was saying, you do still have to kind of watch your your uh, quantity. So having half of the can instead of the whole can, a lot of times those cans, you know, the, the chunkier soups like the Progresso and uh, the Campbell's Chunky brand, those are really two to two and a half servings per can. So, you know, a lot of times we just empty the whole can and that is our meal. And that's really two servings that you're eating. So even when it's a reduced sodium canned soup, it's still going to be high in sodium. Um, ramen noodles, we, uh, we, I eat a lot of ramen noodles in my house. Uh, my kids love it. That a package of ramen noodles is two servings, but you're not going to eat a half package of ramen noodles because that's not, that's not very much food, you know? So, you know, watching, and it's not the ramen noodle itself, but it's going to be that seasoning packet. So there are ways, you know, if anyone has questions about it, I've got tips and tricks for, you know, reducing the use of that seasoning package. So, um, so what, you know, looking at those, learn, and so that brings me to the next 
bullet point is learn to read nutrition labels, learn to look at them and kind of understand, just have a general knowledge of what they mean. You know, avoid foods that have greater than 300 milligrams of sodium per serving um, in terms of like a snack type food or 600 milligrams for a frozen food. So if it's like a, um, you know, the flavored rice, which I, I, I don't know if you, if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about kind of like the rice aroni. I'm not really sure what those are called, but those kinds of things are like the flavored noodles that you just put it in a, you know, half, uh, you know, boil one cup of water, add all of the stuff into, you know, the, the contents of the bag into the boiled water and then that's your meal. You know, those kinds of things, like a side item like that, you'll want to look for less than 300 milligrams of sodium. If it's got a lot of sodium and you're trying to limit, you know, stick around 300 or less, then that's where you'll have to do a little bit of math and kind of figure out, okay, if it's a half a cup, you know, and I only want 300 milligrams of sodium, but it's got 600, then I just have a quarter cup, you know, so you can kind of adjust your portion size. Um, and then with uh, the frozen meals, you want to look for around 600 milligrams. It's going to be a pretty decent. And nowadays, there's a lot of options out there for frozen meals, like, you know, the Lean Cuisines, the Healthy Choices. You know, there's all different brands, the Annie's brand. And a lot of these companies are becoming a little more health conscious. They know that the American people want a product that is better for them. And so they are reducing their salt uh, content in a lot of these products, I've noticed. So so that's good. Um if you really want to get down to looking at the ingredients labels, which can be a little difficult because the print can be very, very small, uh, try to, if you're wanting to look at that, avoid foods that list salt in the first five items in the ingredients list. The way ingredients lists work is that the first item that is listed is going to be what that product has the most of. And then the last item that is listed is going to be what that product has the least of. So if it's not listed in that first five ingredients, you'll, you, you can kind of get an idea, okay, it probably doesn't have as much, not that it doesn't have a lot, but that it doesn't have as much. And so that's also a strategy that you can use if you're wanting to look at the um, ingredients list. Avoid, this one's tricky, this next one, avoid purchasing meats that are packaged in a solution or are pre-seasoned. So the pre-season is what I was talking about earlier when you get those packaged meats or fishes that already have the butter and the herbs and the flavoring and you just have to pop it in your oven when you get home. Um, <clears throat> purchasing meats that are packaged that are not packaged in a solution can be a little trickier because when you look at the meat at the store, it looks like it's fresh meat. You know, when you buy a chicken, it's packaged in kind of a, a vacuum bag and it's got a liquid in there. So what you're wanting to look at, and this can get a little hard, you've got to look at the label and it will say whether or not it's packaged in a solution. When it's packaged in a solution, it's typically, it's all, always typically a sodium-based solution. And what that does is it keeps that meat juicy and, and, and fresh tasting. So, but that is going to be added sodium to that meat. So you're thinking, well, I'm purchasing a fresh chicken. I'm cooking it at home rather than, you know, buying, you know, a, a rotisserie chicken at Costco or something like that, you know, that's already seasoned. But it, it can be a little tricky in that respect, too. So, you know, they do sell now. Um, you can't always depend on the word natural, um, but a lot of times that label, when it says natural, typically the natural labels will not be packaged in a solution. But depending on the brand, because there's no regulation around the way they label these things. So depending on the brand. So once you kind of get an idea, you know, once you kind of know, okay, these are the brands that I can have and these are the brands that I, I should avoid, then you don't have to look at the labels every time you go to the grocery store. But, you know, when I started reading labels back, you know, before I got my degree, um, I was spending an extra, you know, 40 minutes in the grocery store reading all the labels. And now I just know what I buy and know what not to buy, you know, based on what, um, what I already, the knowledge that I already have about the labels. Now, labels can change, you know, um, ingredients, they don't have to list when they change their ingredients, you know, so like, a lot of times, um, drinks, uh, I see this often in drink products. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know any specific names off the top of my head, but, you know, say like a, a fruit punch type thing. It may not have used to. Oh, I've got a good example. In the past, non-dairy creamer was, did not have phosphorus additive to it. And we, a lot of the dietitians, the renal dietitians, and, the, you know, just the renal community recommended using non-dairy creamer for people who were trying to avoid the phosphorus. Well, at some point, they changed, a lot of them changed their formulations. And now most all of them that I've seen do contain phosphorus additives. And so there are a few still on the shelves that don't, but that's where, you know, you've got to, and they don't announce, oh, by the way, we've started adding phosphorus to our ingredients list, you know, watch out dialysis or renal patients, you know, they don't announce these things. So that's, you know, that can come in handy to just occasionally take a look, you know, and just see what's, what's going on there. So um, when dining out, order items that are freshly prepared, such as grilled chicken or or fish, and you can ask for no added salt or sauces. Sometimes things will come with like a gravy or say, oh, you know, if you get like a bourbon glazed uh, salmon or, you know, a country fried steak or something like that, it's going to have a gravy on it. You can always ask when they're cooking something, um, when they're preparing your food to order, that means that they're cooking it when you order it. It's not just all sitting out. So you can always ask them to put things on the side, leave things off. You know, I've been to a lot of these steakhouses, you know, you, you order your steak and then you have to order, you know, your vegetables a la carte. And sometimes they just have, you know, sauteed um, spinach. And so I know that sauteed spinach means that they saute it in butter. It's probably salted butter. There's going to be added salt and seasoning on there. And instead I'll ask for steamed spinach. And then I can kind of control the salt on my own. And so that's, that's another strategy, you know, don't, don't be afraid to ask, you know, you're paying for a service, you know, that, that is what they are there to do. And so don't be afraid to ask for your dressings on the side, your sauces on the side for things to be prepared without any seasoning or salt. Um, that is always an option for you when you're dining out. If you must use salt when you're cooking, sprinkle on a pinch of sea salt after you're finished cooking the food. So when you're cooking and you're shaking the salt on the food, directly onto the food in the pan, it can kind of get like diluted in the sauce and, you know, or the, the, you know, you might be, say you're making like a stir fry and, you know, your, your, your vegetables are going to produce a little water and that salt's going to be a little bit diluted. So you'll want to end up sprinkling, sprinkling on more, you know, but then once you're done cooking that vegetable, if you don't drain it, all of that salt is still in those juices and then you put it on your plate and you've got a lot of that sodium still goes onto your plate. If you cook your food and then take a little bit of salt and sprinkle it on after, that salt is going to kind of stay on the surface of the food. And I say sea salt here um, in my notes specifically because sea salt is a larger grain of salt. So if you're using iodized salt, you know, um, just regular table salt, the, the grains of salt are so fine, sometimes even almost kind of powdery, and you'll end up adding a lot more salt on there than you probably mean to. And so sea salt can be kind of a useful strategy because it's a larger grain. So you're kind of not able to pick up as much, you know, and then you're going to get some good salty flavor um, on, on your food without having to shake the salt on, which offers you a little less control. I will mention here that not all salts are created equally. So when you have like um, a quarter teaspoon of salt has about 600 milligrams of sodium, you're gonna have salt, different salts are gonna have different flavor profiles. I know that sounds kind of strange because you're thinking probably, well, salt just tastes like salt. There are gonna be some nuances, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of times we use, if you use like an iodized salt, that's going to taste a lot saltier than if you use like a non-iodized salt, or I prefer to use the, the Diamond Crystal brand salt in my kitchen cooking. I do keep, you know, some Himalayan sea salt if I want something a little fancy. Um, I do keep uh, some regular sea salt, just like I think it's uh, Morton's brand or, you know, whatever store brand, uh, for if I wanted to say, you know, 
do something like salt my pasta water, which I don't really do very often. Um, I'll tell you what I really use it for, which you might laugh about this, but I really use it for um, if my steps outside get a little icy. And I live in Nashville, so we don't often get icy. Um, I don't know where all of you guys are, but you know, I don't need a lot of salt for that kind of condition. So I just take my little salt shaker out there and just sprinkle some salt out there on the ice. And it just gives me a little more traction when I'm going down my stairs. And I only have two stairs. So it's it's not a, you know, I'm, I'm not dealing with a lot of ice down here. But um, that's typically what I keep that salt for because I don't want to put my, my expensive diamond crystal salt out there. And it's not expensive, but it's, you know, a little higher than just regular, you know, salt. So, um, Anyways, so that's a strategy for you if you're trying to cut back on salt, but you can't cut back on it completely. You can sprinkle a little bit on after preparing the food. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, potassium is a mineral that aids in muscle movement and control. When your kidneys don't work as well as they used to, potassium can quickly build up in your body. So our main concern with this, this is going to, this can cause, um, kind of muscle twitching, uh, cramping, things like that. But it can also change the way your heart beats, which can lead to a heart attack. So if you've been told that your potassium is high or it's borderline high, some of the foods that you are gonna wanna avoid are gonna be potatoes, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams, any kind of um, tuber vegetables, bananas, oranges, orange juice, grapefruit juice, tomatoes, tomato sauce, tomato soup, um, melons such as cantaloupe and honeydew, dried beans, pumpkins and winter melons, and uh, cooked leafy greens, or greens such as like turnip greens, kale, and Swiss chard. Those are going to be some of the vegetables and fruits that are a little higher. Most all, all fruits and vegetables do contain potassium, but there are going to be medium and lower potassium options. And it's just going to be about your portion control. If your potassium is really high, I would avoid all of these foods. If your potassium is borderline high, you might just reduce your intake of some of these foods and then, you know, have your, your, your healthcare provider will, will probably keep a close eye on that if you've been told that it runs high. Next slide, please. Okay, phosphorus. Phosphorus is another mineral that is really important for us to keep an eye on, for you to keep an eye on. When phosphorus levels get too high in your blood, calcium can be pulled from your bones and deposited into your soft tissues like your heart. This can make it more likely for you to break bones because that calcium is being pulled out so your bones are getting weaker and it can be more likely for you to have a heart condition, have heart attack, things like that. So if your phosphorus is high, some of the foods that you should avoid or limit are going to be dairy products like milk, cheese, ice cream, yogurt. You should try to limit these to no more than one serving per day um, if you're going to have them at all. Some cereals such as bran cereals, wheat cereals, oatmeal and granola, try to limit the, the servings of those to maybe once or twice per week. Your whole grains and your wheat uh, breads are going to be higher in phosphorus than in white bread. Some drinks such as cola drinks, the pepper type colas, uh, certain brands of root beer, not most, but there are some brands of root beer. Most brands of root beer do not contain phosphorus. Um, beer is going to contain phosphorus and some flavored waters and juice drinks. And this can be tricky too with the drinks. Some drinks will contain phosphorus depending on the type of container that it comes in. So it, it can be very tricky. So take, for instance, a Minute Maid Fruit Punch. If it, if it actually comes in, I, I remember counting one time, and I think it comes in like 8 to 12 different types of containers. You've got the juice box. You've got the carton that comes in the refrigerated section. You've got the 2-liter plastic. You've got the 20-ounce plastic. You've got, you know, all these different types of containers that the same drink comes in. So you might think, oh, well, I bought it in the, the carton last time. This is safe, but they only have the two liter plastic container available this time. I'm sure it's fine. Well, that two liter plastic container is the one that's going to contain the phosphorus. And the reason why is because uh, plastic, excuse me, is porous. And so air exchanges in and out of plastic. And so they have to add phosphorus 
to that product to, to preserve it. Whereas the carton Minute Maid, if you guys are familiar, you buy that in the refrigerated section. So it's chilled. And so that's where that difference comes in. They don't have to add that phosphorus additive to preserve it when it's in the carton in the refrigerated section. So this can be really, really tricky. So this is gonna be where being able to look at labels and identify phosphorus additives is, is gonna, can, can, can be helpful here. You know, definitely ask your healthcare provider if you have concerns or questions about the specific drinks that you choose. Um, fast foods and processed foods should really be limited or avoided completely. It's gonna be high phosphorus, it's gonna be high sodium, you know, there's going to just be a lot of things in there that probably aren't going to do you any good. Now, I say all of this limiting and avoiding. Life happens. We're all regular people. We're all doing regular things. You're going to have moments where you're going to have these foods, and that's okay. You know, don't beat yourself up about it. This is a process of just being aware and having the knowledge and avoiding when you can and accepting when you can't avoid it, you know, and they're, they're, you're going to have moments like that. And that that's going to be okay. This is about the long term goal, not necessarily the short term benefits. Um, next slide, please. Okay, if you have start now we're shifting gears, you're you're no longer in CKD one through four, you've started dialysis. So it's definitely safe to say that your dietary needs are going to be a little bit different than before. Um, your calorie needs are going to increase. And the type of dialysis that you receive will affect by how much. So if you are receiving peritoneal dialysis, the dialysate solution that's used to clean your blood in this kind of dialysis, it contains carbohydrates. And so the calories from this solution will be absorbed by your body. So your actual consumption of increased calories, it doesn't actually need to be increased by that much because you're getting, on average, it depends on, you know, how much what what percent the the concentration of solution that you're using how much solution you're using um, whether or not you're using the machine to do peritoneal dialysis or if you're doing it manually it will depend on some factors but generally on average somewhere between 200 to 300 calories will come from your dialysate solution with peritoneal dialysis so this is where it's going to be important to discuss those specific needs with you, with your healthcare provider get a clear idea of what those increased needs might be, because it will be, be dependent from person to person, you know, um, so so that they can calculate, you know, what treatment you're on, how much you're getting, and, and give you an estimate of how much, many calories you're probably absorbing with the solution. Your protein needs are going to increase significantly in comparison to uh, when you were uh, before you started dialysis. And this can take a little bit of getting used to for some folks who were limiting their proteins before. You know, it can be a little difficult for them, for people to make adjust to this change. So oftentimes a protein supplement can come in handy to help people meet those higher protein needs. A lot of times, you know, these higher protein needs, it, it feels, it can feel very daunting because you know, you don't feel well by this point. Some some people don't feel well by this point. Their appetite is suppressed. Then they're starting this dialysis that's providing calories, so they're not getting those hunger cues that they were getting before. And it can be difficult to eat more food. So that protein supplement can be really handy um, to have something to kind of fill in the gaps throughout the day. Um, your potassium, phosphorus, sodium, and fluid intakes are going to need to be more closely managed at this point, and that is something that your uh, healthcare providers will definitely discuss with you. Um, at this point, a lot of times, sometimes people who are in CKD will have started a phosphorus binder, and that's a medication that can help them um, absorb that phosphorus in the foods that they're eating and take it out of their body. Sometimes they haven't had to because they still have good kidney residual function. Their kidneys are still working well enough that it's removing a lot of those things. Um, and then typically by the time they start dialysis, most people need to start some kind of medication to help manage their phosphorus levels. Not all, but a lot of them do. Um, and so that, that's something that your healthcare provider will definitely talk to you about and make adjustments and find the right fit for you. Next slide, please. Okay, plant-based diet, is it right for you? 
So you might be looking at the slide and wondering, how could a plant-based diet help you increase, meet your increased protein needs? So we're just going to take a little bit of look at how it could be a great fit for you. So typically, the typical dialysis diet tends to lean away from plant-based diets because these diets can be higher in potassium since a lot of plant-based diet plant-based diets are going to be, you know, include fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains, beans, and legumes. And these are all foods that are generally higher in potassium. But there are some studies that show that following a plant-based diet has some benefits that kind of override that. Not necessarily, I mean, you know, we don't want your potassium to be off the charts, but, you know, if your potassium is able to be managed, um, it can help to improve your cardiovascular health improve inflammatory markers, improve your gut microbiota, and alleviate constipation. And so all of these things are going to help, you know, improving your cardiovascular health, improving inflammatory markers are actually going to help your protein lab. So it, you're like, wait, but how does that work? You're not eating meat animal proteins that we're kind of, you know, accustomed to eating more of. And that can improve those inflammatory markers, which can help increase your protein lab. So it, it, these, this is where it can really benefit you. Um, another benefit of following a plant-based diet may be that it can decrease your phosphorus levels, as the phosphorus that's found in plant-based diets is less easily absorbed. So, you know, it can, sometimes it can be a little harder to meet your protein needs um, on a plant-based diet. But again, there are a lot of protein supplements that can help you bridge those gaps. Your dialysis center will likely offer some protein supplements. Most dialysis uh, centers do, but there are also hundreds of options that you can purchase. I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, there's powders, there's bars, there's candies, there's gummies, there's drinks, you know. But remember, it's always really important to discuss any diet changes that you wanna make or starting new supplements with your healthcare team so that they can keep a closer eye on things like your potassium levels and your phosphorus levels and your fluid levels. You know, sometimes people will drink some of these drinks and then they've gained, they're gaining a lot of fluid, their potassium gets high. So your healthcare provider will want to know, you know, oh, if your potassium gets high, oh, tell me about the drinks that you're doing. Are you still drinking that boost high protein or whatever, you know, of, of nutritional shake and you know, I have a patient actually currently currently now who um, she was drinking two nutritional shakes a day and her potassium got quite high. And this has happened to her in the past. And so we have to kind of rein her back in and, and just let her know, okay, well, why don't we stop for now, let your potassium come down, and then we can talk about how we can reintroduce uh, that, that food that she really enjoys. She really enjoys having her nutritional drinks. And they help her a lot too. You know, her her protein lab is, you know, 4.0, which is a fantastic protein lab, you know. So, um, so you know, definitely make sure to be taught having that open dialogue with your healthcare team. Next slide, please. Okay. Just to dive in a little bit more to the differences in the diet when you're receiving a different modality of dialysis. Um, we touched on this a little bit in the previous slide, but you know, there may be some differences in the diet that are recommended depending on the type of dialysis that you're on. So for the most part, the diet recommendations for in-center hemodialysis and peritoneal and home dialysis will be very similar with some exceptions. So with peritoneal dialysis, like I mentioned, your blood is getting cleaned by putting that dialysate solution into your abdomen and through osmosis and diffusion, toxins are gonna be removed from your body. So along with those toxins that are removed, more potassium and more protein is going to be removed in peritoneal dialysis than when compared to hemodialysis. So many people who receive peritoneal dialysis, they're going to need to liberalize their diets to include more high potassium foods and proteins to meet their needs. So, you know, it's a little bit of the opposite of what you, you know, you, you may read about online, you know, um, and, and some of what we've talked about, too. So, you know, sometimes in some cases, the um, potassium can get so low in peritoneal dialysis patients that they have to take a potassium supplement 
in order to keep their potassium levels up. So it, that, you know, it can be, and so not only do they need to liberalize di their diet, but they can't even eat enough potassium foods to keep that potassium level up. And so a potassium supplement can come in really handy in this case. Of course, the protein supplements can be really handy in this case. Um, and then, you know, like I mentioned, calorie needs are going to be decreased a little with the PD dialysis, then the solution is going to contain those calories. For those who are receiving hemodialysis at home, since this type of treatment is usually longer and more frequent than in-center hemodialysis, we often see that nutritional goals with these patients are met really well. And so these folks may be able to really liberalize their diets to include a lot more food than they realized or than they were able to when they were in center hemodialysis. So a lot of our home hemodialysis patients, they do their treatments five, six times a, a week. And, you know, it's for a little bit longer. Instead of three hours, they might do it for four and a half, five hours. And so they're getting really good dialysis in these cases. And so, you know, a lot of our home hemodialysis patients, they're able to kind of do, do a lot more, eat a lot more things than they wouldn't otherwise be able to eat. Um, and, you know, of course, as I've mentioned many times, you guys are probably sick of hearing me say this, every person is different. So it's really important to discuss all of these, you know, your personal needs with your healthcare team. Next slide, please. Okay, you've been transplanted. What is next? Your life will drastically change once you are transplanted. And this does not exclude diet changes. Your new goal at this point will be to take care of your new kidney as best as you can to prolong its life as much as possible. So depending on how long you've had your new kidney, your diet needs are going to need to be adjusted accordingly. So if it's soon after your surgery and you're still in the hospital and you know recovering from your surgery, you're going to need to consume additional calories and protein because that is going to help you heal from your surgery and help you prevent infection. You know, they've been in there, they're moving things around, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, you've been open up for a long time, you know, there's a high risk for infection. So having that increased calories and increased, increased protein intake is going to help you, your body kind of build its immune system and, and be aware of what's going on and fight off any infection that wants to settle in there. Um, also at this point, you're likely going to be experiencing sudden electrolyte changes because your new kidney is working hard and it's it's kind of working ferociously and your electrolytes like your potassium, your magnesium, your sodium, your phosphorus may suddenly become too low because your kidney's just working, 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 you know. So your doctors are going to monitor your labs over and over and over while you're in the hospital. And they're likely going to give you supplements to help you replace some of those losses until that new kidney kind of stabilizes itself enough for you to leave the hospital. For the first few months after your transplant, your transplant team will follow your labs very closely, make sure your kidneys are working properly, make sure that you know your medications are working and you know everything's okay. Um, at this point, things have probably kind of stabilized um, since your surgery, and you won't need to be as concerned about those sudden electrolyte shifts, um, but you may have to avoid certain foods that can affect the way some of your anti-rejection medications work. So some foods can um, interact with the medications, the new medications that you're on, and it can change the way that they absorb or they break down. And so these are some of some of those foods you're going to have to watch, you know, grapefruit, grapefruit juice, star fruit, pomegranate, black licorice, you know, like real black licorice. These are some of the foods that can interfere with the uh, medication. So those are going to be some of the things that you're going to want to watch out for at that point. Um, because we want those anti-rejection medications to work because that's what's going to help keep that kidney going. So the main long-term consideration, um, aside from the immediate consideration that I just mentioned with avoiding those foods, but the main long-term consideration is to follow a diet that will minimize your risk of developing diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Um, there's you know, the medications that you're on are going to be um, a factor in, in developing these uh, conditions. 
So you're going to want to be kind of aware of that. There's not a lot of research on the best diet for long-term transplant patients, but there is a general consensus in, um, in healthcare that following a Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet have protective benefits. And you guys know the DASH diet is the reduced sodium diet. Um, these diets focus on reduced meat and processed food with increased fruits and vegetables and limiting sodium intake. So the Mediterranean diet, which emphasizes um, high unsaturated fats found in olive oils, fish, nuts, low saturated fats that are found in red meat, have been shown to reduce risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, and mortality in kidney transplant recipients, and just overall improved kidney function in transplanted patients. Since you guys are all, you know, logged in here and listening to this um, topic, I imagine that you are, you know, cognizant of the different diets, healthy diets that people talk about. And so I'm sure that you've heard about Mediterranean diet having a lot of benefits in people who don't have you know, who are not kidney transplanted, there's a lot of benefits in following that Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So, you know, and that, so that does translate um, it to also kidney transplant recipients. If you follow the Mediterranean diet and the principles of the DASH diet, which is just reduced sodium, um, which helps you control your blood pressure, you can help protect the long-term health of your new kidney and reduce the risk of developing other uh, illnesses and comorbidities. Next slide, please. Oh, it's a little hazy, but I just wanted to end on this funny comment. And it's just, you know, I just wanna, wanted to end here because it's just showing, I just wanna express that we can't achieve per perfection because it doesn't exist. You know, if you were trying to avoid all of the foods, all of the things, you know, I, oh, I can't eat this list of the foods on this list of, um, you know, on this list because they, they contain phosphorus or foods on this list because they contain potassium. Well, all fruits and vegetables are going to contain potassium. Um, most all foods are going to contain phosphorus. So if you were trying to avoid everything, you would be like this guy and you would have an empty plate. So, you know, you really can't live like that. And so, but the key is to seek the knowledge, you know, do your best and be gentle with yourself. You know, like I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, having the knowledge is the first step. Implementing the, that knowledge is the second. And then just giving yourself some grace because, you know, we're all people, we're all human beings. We have to be able to live our lives and enjoy some, you know, it's just about having that balance between, you know, um, doing some things that you, that you really enjoy, but not going overboard on that. So that is all for today. Um, does anyone have any questions? I don't think I saw any questions coming through. You guys don't have to be shy. I don't know all the answers, but I will try my hardest to answer them the best I can. And it looks like you have given a lot of information and no one has questions about it. Um, okay. I'll ask one quick question. Uh, somebody that I know who is who has a transplant is often concerned about certain um, kinds of food that he eats or different kinds of fish. And so could you address, are there, you know, should people watch either salmon or shrimp for certain kinds of, of fish when they have a transplant? I think that with transplant patients, because of the immunosuppressants that they're taking, they have to be aware of foodborne illnesses. And so sometimes we kind of associate 
you know, undercooked, you know, you see at the bottom of menus that it'll say like, um, there'll be like a disclaimer, you know, consuming foods that are raw or undercooked may cause foodborne illness, you know, proceed at your own risk. You've seen those, you see those in like restaurants. A lot of times I'll see that in the fine print at the bottom. And so, um, so that is one thing that transplant patients have to watch for, foodborne illnesses. We do have to be aware, though, that a lot of foodborne illnesses now occur from foods that we don't typically think of as having, uh, being, you know, um, risky, such as, you know, I think there was a recent, recent in the past few months, a recall on peanut butter, because um, there was some something going on with the production of this brand of peanut butter. I think it, I, I can't remember if it was E. coli or salmonella or listeria. Um, a lot of times you hear about a food outbreaks being uh, from unwashed lettuce or unwashed spinach, things like that. So we do, as a transplant patient, it is really important to watch where the foodborne illness is. Um, another thing with those, some certain seafoods, you know, there are going to be seafoods that are higher in mercury and that's something that we all want to watch out for, you know, uh, whether you have a transplant or not, you know, whether you're CKD or, or not, um, you know, being careful not to consume fish and seafood that has very high uh, mercury levels. It's not that you can't have it, you know, but just making sure to limit the amount of those kinds of uh, seafoods. So that could be why. Um, that's something that he's watching. If he has personal reasons that I'm not aware of, you know, I'm not, I'm not certain, you know, what his healthcare right. provider has told him. Yeah, but, um, but those are some things that come to my mind immediately. Okay, good point. It looks like you have a question there in the chat box now about um, if you can address dialysis malnutrition. Dialysis malnutrition. So dialysis malnutrition is something we see very commonly. And malnutrition is one of those terms that I find to be a little misleading because in, in our minds, in the general population's minds, I should say, and in healthcare providers' minds, honestly, um, I've met a lot, I've come across physicians, uh, healthcare providers who think that malnutrition looks a certain way um, that, you know, when you have malnutrition, you're underweight, you're wasted, you have, you know, lean body mass wasting, and that's not always the case. Malnutrition can encompass, you know, um, so many things, you know, not having access to good, healthy foods, and it doesn't necessarily look the way that people want to think it looks. You know, you can have uh, someone who is by definition, on the obese range of the BMI scale, um, and yet they experience malnutrition because they're not getting the foods that they need to kind of sustain their health. And so dialysis malnutrition, it, this is a very broad um, a question that I, I could really spiral into a deep dive here, Celia. So if I don't answer your question specifically, please type in. But dialysis malnutrition is very common because not only are we looking at people who are needing more calories and yet getting fewer calories because of so many different factors, you know, like I mentioned earlier, if you're receiving peritoneal dialysis, you're getting a constant supply of sugar and calories. So your brain, your hunger cues don't kick in. Um, so you're, and I see your next follow-up question here. So the, it, not only are you, are you in a, a state of receiving fewer calories than you need, but then also you're limited to so much. You feel like you can't eat anything. And so dialysis malnutrition is very common for so many different factors. And then a lot of times our dialysis patients, you know, um, generally they're coming from a, a place where they're disadvantaged socioeconomically. So they are already coming in with malnutrition at a disadvantage, you know. So for them to be able to eat more and eat more nutritiously can be really difficult. So should patients consume more protein? Absolutely. Um, when you're in dialysis, so just to give you, if you're, if you're a numbers person and you like to do a little bit of math, the typical, when we say um, for CKD, moderate protein 
is going to be 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And so if you take your pounds and you divide them by 2.2, that's going to give you your kilogram of body weight. That is going to be a CKD moderate protein. That is also the recommendation for the general public who does not have any health issues. So it's, it's the same. The American diet, typically con we consume a lot more than 0.8 uh, grams per kilogram. For dialysis patients, it's going to increase to anywhere between 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram. And then if you factor in, if you've got uh, some kind of inflammatory markers, if you've got an infection of some sort, if you are on hemodialysis and you have a catheter that runs straight into your uh, cardiovascular system, straight into your heart, that is going to create inflammation. Your personal protein needs could be even higher. And then factor in, you're not that hungry, you're sick, you don't feel well, you don't feel like eating. It's going to be really hard to meet those needs. So it, it can be difficult. And that's where those protein supplements are going to be handy. Um, tricks to, um, I, I get this this a lot. Absolutely. We, and, and, and in a lot of cases, you've got people coming in, they've got diabetes, they have high blood pressure, and now they're dealing with kidney disease. And they're like, what can I eat? You know, if you remember, if we go back to the slide, um, if you can remember the phosphorus slide, we talked about um, wheat and whole grain breads being higher in phosphorus. And if you're diabetic, you've been told you should eat wheat and whole grain breads because, and, and brown rice and whole grains and oats and granola and bran cereals because it helps to decrease that glycemic, it, it's a lower glycemic intake, uh, uh, glycemic index, and it helps to decrease that fast increase in your blood sugar. And now you're on dialysis and you're like, but wait a minute, I was told to do that. And now I can't do that. So what can I have? And so that's where it's really important to talk to your healthcare provider, look at your labs and say, okay, my phosphorus levels are good. You know, they have always been good. They are normal. I can have wheat and whole grains and brands sometimes, and that's going to be fine. So that is why I kept repeating you know, like a broken record. Talk to your healthcare provider, have that open dialogue, have that conversation. You know, it's unfortunate that for CKD, there is not a lot of access to dialysis, uh, to, to dietitians and to nutritional care. And um, that is, that is really unfortunate. And a lot of patients are left kind of Googling, you know, and, and Google can only get you so far, you know, it's not going to be able to meet those personal needs. And so, you know, try to find, if you're able to, in your community, try to find a dietitian that that is specialized in working with renal patients. I've had people cold call me on the phone. I don't know them. I, they are just patients that have just looked me up and called me. And, and you know, I, I try to help them best I can, but I always say you've got to talk to your healthcare provider because they are the ones that are, that are going to know you and what your personal specific needs are going to be. So it, it is really hard. It, it can be really hard. And, uh, you know, I, my, I just, it, it's hard. But that is where we come in and we're able to kind of help guide you through this process. Oh, thank you so much, Fanny, for, for answering the questions. And thank you for sharing all of your expertise and information today in a, in a way that was easy to understand. Um, very much appreciated. And I also want to thank everyone here for uh, sharing the hour with us. Please complete the feedback form. And yeah. we hope that you will yeah. join us on August 25th for our next learning session, which will be on uh, understanding your lab values more. So join us next month and um, stay safe and stay cool in this hot weather. Thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you everyone.